Welcome to Our Scars Speak. My name is Christina Miner. I'm the host of this podcast. And before we begin, yes, we may be professionals up here. Um, my, she's definitely a professional as well as myself in my own right. However, we are not taking any type of accountability or responsibility for anything that you hear on this podcast today. Um, I want to make for sure that you all definitely listen to your own medical professionals, your own doctors, your own therapist, or whomever you see, stick to your treatment plan. We are not suggesting and we are not advising you listening to your own discretion. Um, and today we have Dr. Eleonora Tim, Tim I, can't, I don't want to pronounce your name wrong, Tapolinsky. Okay, I did so well on the reel. I just... I went back and kept on listening to you say your name. Um, Doc, my patients call, all call me Dr. T. I find it I, much easier that way. <laughs> I did see that on the Peloton when yeah. you were up there. And I was like, no, I got to get her name though for the real. So I did, did do good with that. I wrote it out how you say it, but then I just messed up. So, That's all but I, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Um, I adore you. I watch your stuff all the time on Instagram. I have no idea how I ran into you on social media, but I'm thankful that I did. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have to ask her to come on. Um, she may say no, but I got to give it a try. So thank you again for coming on tonight. Thank you for asking me. I'm always, I think it's so wonderful to reach, you know, to be on other people's podcasts and reach other communities. And I'm thrilled to be here and I'm so glad you reached out. Yeah, yeah. I always say, my dad always said never, before he passed away, he said never um, avoid asking a question because you'll never know what the response may be. It may actually be yes. So I always do that now. <laughs> um, so before we even get into everything cancer related, because you are an oncologist, but I'm gonna let you share what exactly you do. But who are you as a person? Who is Eleonora? Oh, I love this question. So um, I, I am an oncologist. Um, that is only one part of what I do. I am a wife. I'm a mom of two girls. They're five and seven. They are the loves of my life. Um, I'm a runner. I run marathons. And that is really the one thing that I do for me only. I think every, mm -hmm. we do so many things for so many people in our lives. Um, but running is really, for me, it's the time where I can disconnect from the world and people always ask well what do you what do you do you're running these you know for hours what do you think about it and honestly nothing like I zone out that is um just really my time to be present and engaged uh, with my with myself um I love books I love owning books I have books all over my house um I don't I read a lot but there's I own a lot more books than I read um I love traveling uh you know and I think that it's really important and I think what you're doing in humanizing medicine and humanizing doctors is so important because at the end of it, medicine is one part of what we do, but we're all multifaceted people. And so I think, you know, Absolutely. starting off this way is really, really great. Yeah. And that the reason for that, like we, like I shared with you um, before is for that particular reason, just like with, I found on a lot of interviews that I've gone on, people are like, okay, what happened from the day that you found out you had breast cancer? I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, thank you for the opportunity, but I'm more than that. I had a life before breast cancer. So that's why I always ask people before, during, and now, and the same with the professionals, who are you? And now, you know, how did you get to this particular part of your life? But um, I think it's important to know the person, you know, with what, information they're willing to share. So thank you for doing that. Um, so I would like to know, basically, just before you became a doctor, like what even guided you to become an oncologist or to go to medical school? Was it personal? Was it, you know, due to someone in the family or just something that you had a love for? So I've always wanted to be a doctor. Um, it's, it's like a very cliche story, but um, so I was born, I was not born in the United States. My family immigrated here from the former Soviet Union, Ukraine oh. now. And my parents were, when we immigrated here, I was young. My parents were taking night classes, uh, learning English. And I was at home with my baby sister and she had fallen and split her lip on a rocking chair and I cleaned it up. And honestly, like, it's so cliche, but I was like, no, I'm going to be a doctor. And like, I... <laughs> 
I'm the type of person like if I say it, I'm gonna do it. And so that was mm-hmm. it. Like from the time I was very young, I was like, I'm gonna be a doctor. Um, and then my grandmother um did have ovarian cancer. She passed away from that in 2005. And so I always knew I loved women's health. And I think that experience kind of really guided me toward oncology. And I wasn't sure if it was gonna be uh gynecologic oncology or pediatric, mm-hmm. but ultimately adult hematology oncology really was where kind of I really liked internal medicine um I'm not I don't I I realized that surgery wasn't what I was interested in um for me and so it kind of just all kind of fit together and I minored in women and gender studies in college and really like that women's advocacy um and now I mean I I treat breast and gynecologic cancer so it's really kind of you know sometimes sometimes things align the way that they're meant to and for me like it just aligned perfectly because I get to do what I've always wanted to do. Right. And what's your full title? Uh, so I'm uh, the head of breast and gynecologic medical oncology at Valley Health System in New Jersey. I'm also a clinical assistant professor of medicine at Mount Sinai in New York. Okay. Because I was like, I know she's part of Mount Sinai, but I yeah. need to do research. We're, we're kind of- <laughs> We're an affiliate of Mount Sinai. So Mount Sinai has a lot of hospitals that are kind of part of the network. Um, it's kind of, it, it's more, it, it, it's probably more complicated than it really is, but you know, we're one of the Mount Sinai kind of affiliates. So I work only in New Jersey, but I'm part of the Mount Sinai network. Okay. So what I predicted was correct. Well, not predicted, but I did my research and I was like, okay, it looks like they're affiliated or linked or something, but maybe Mount Sinai is the major yeah. Yeah. hospital. Okay. Great. Um, so that's sort of like what led you then exactly far as like with your grandmother, like you have an actual personal yeah. connection, like it's personal for you um, to a degree as well when it comes to cancer, it sounds like because of what your grandmother went through. Absolutely. I mean, you know, she was diagnosed um, when I was a, when I was 16 and it was, so that was in 1999, 2000, and then she passed away in 2005. And, you know, at the time, you know, that was almost 20 mm. years ago. And, you know, at the time thing, we didn't have the drugs that we have now. We didn't have PARP inhibitors. You know, we were still kind of learning things about certain chemotherapies. Mm-hmm. And so it's just so striking to me how much has progressed in the last 20 years. But that experience for me was really kind of, I was very involved in her care. I was on the phone with, you know, her oncologist. Mm-hmm. I was at her bedside. So it really kind of solidified, like, this is the field that I, you know, want to go into. And I don't talk about that so much because my platform is really more about education and helping other Mm -hmm. people. But I think it is an important part of why I decided to go into, you know, this field. That's very important. I think a lot of times as a patient, and also I used to work in the medical field as well. And so my reason for going that direction, I was a nurse assistant at the time. I was a level two nurse assistant and I loved it, but I, it came from helping care for my aunt who was passing away of cancer. And I think when we share, you know, we don't want to share too much of our personal life, but when we have those links, it really can help the patient to say, oh, okay, wow, they understand. From they, they may not understand what I'm going through, but they've seen someone who's going through what I'm going through. And I think it just brings like the personal part into it as well. Absolutely. Um, I, I will add that, you know, when you're seeing your oncologist or any other doctor that you have a relationship mm-hmm. with, and you're seeing this person over and over again. And I think whatever, you do have to find that common, that link or something that unites you, that you connect with beyond mm-hmm. just that disease. Yeah, that's true because I know when I didn't know at the time um, when I was saying what I was saying to my doctor, but when my first consultation, which we're going to get into in just a second, I looked at her and I was like, I need for you to treat me as if I was your mom or yourself or your sister or somebody close, not just to practice medicine. Like I need for you to make this personal because I don't know what's going on and I'm trusting you with my health. But then I found out that her mother did have breast cancer before. So that was like her driving force too. Like she wants to get rid of cancer completely. So yeah, so it it definitely makes a difference. Um, With that being said, as far as appointments, (laughs) I would like for you to kind of, because I've heard you on one of your um, 
uh, it was one of your uh, probably TikToks or something, but I heard you talk about like tips for like seeing your doctor for the first time. And we've talked about on here before about seeing like a breast surgeon, but far as going to oncologists, cause you know, there's so many different, you got the oncologist, you got the radiologist, you have the breast surgeon. So for you, do you have any tips or anything you would like for people to know, like when they're first coming to you, things maybe they could expect or things they may need to um, definitely take in consideration far as talking to their oncologist? Absolutely. I have a few tips that I can share. So number one, I think the key is whoever is referring you to the oncologist, whether that's your breast surgeon, whether it's your primary care, whoever it is, you want to ask them, why are you referring me to the medical oncologist? And it seems silly. Um, but I can't tell you how many people I see who think that I said, you know, do you know why you're here? Because I don't want to start talking about chemotherapy if you have no idea that you need chemo, right? Because then, then it's a disconnect from yep. the beginning. And I can't tell you how many people are like, oh, so we're going to talk about radiation. No, no, nope, we're not going to do that because I'm not the radiation doctor. Um, or people are like, I don't know why I'm here. And so when you know what you're coming to talk about, or it may be as, you know, your breast surgeon may say, I don't know what treatment you need, but you need some treatment. And that's where you're going to see the medical oncologist. So I think just being a little bit prepared, number one. Number two is write down your questions in advance. Um, and if you don't know, if you're not sure what to ask, there's a lot of resources online. You can even search, you know, what to ask a medical oncologist. But I think come, at least reading some of those questions and writing them down, people think they remember. And there's a lot that happens at that visit. And um, you, you don't. And so that way you don't miss anything. And number three is bring someone with you. Uh, and if you can't bring someone with you, there are ways that you can either have maybe your family or your friend is working. So maybe they can be on FaceTime or mm -hmm. on the phone or maybe ask if you can record if you don't have mm -hmm. anyone with you. And then sometimes people truly just don't have someone they can bring. And if that's the case, my best advice here is reach out. There's so many you know, Facebook groups. And I've had people say, I posted in my group and I said, I'm newly diagnosed with breast cancer. I don't have anyone to take me. Is there anyone available? And there are so many people in these communities that want to help that maybe are retired. They're giving back of their time. And mm -hmm. it can be, it's a little bit vulnerable putting yourself out there, but it can really help because coming alone, I think is hard. Um, and you just don't retain as much. So in those cases, maybe you ask if you can record or you know say can you take some notes from you know whatever whatever it is um and our cancer center we actually like our navigator if you really don't have anyone our navigator can come up and sit with you and, mm. and help you so I think there's ways but I think the key is you know not being afraid to ask right that's so important. So important. I tell people I always tell people ask to record because so many people have to go by themselves. Um but yeah having that network having because honestly, cancer, I, fa <laughs> I had a problem with vulnerability until I had cancer. <laughs> and it, it just kind of makes you vulnerable because you have to lean on other people, especially when you're getting surgeries and things of that nature. So yeah, I, th I totally agree with that. So what are, when you were talking about, and oh yeah, you are so right with people not knowing why they're going to oncologists. I've had a lot of people ask me, well, what's the oncologist and what's the radiologist? Um, and they just don't know, like you're getting all the doctors confused because it does go kind of quickly too. And uh, I, will so, say, I will say too that, you know, if you, this is your first experience with cancer, there's really no reason why you would know all these differences and these nuances. Yeah. So don't feel bad about that. I think it's okay to say, Hey, can you just tell me who are all the members of my team and what do they do? Like that's yeah. okay to ask. I think you're right. I think there is this level of vulnerability that we have to kind of put out there. Um, and it's hard mm -hmm. if you are a, you know, a woman who does everything or a man who does everything for themselves. Um, yeah. but you know what, like the more we lean on others, the better the experience can be. Absolutely. And I think having such a good support team, even at the hospital, like you say, your navigator, that's awesome. That's like probably the first time I've heard of the, a hospital doing that. Uh, for me, it was, she sat me down with my family and went over each doctor I potentially could have, which I thought that was phenomenal because I worked in, you know, a medical field, but it wasn't necessarily with cancer patients all the time, unless they were coming and they, you know, I see you, but it makes a total difference, total difference when you have some information um, ahead of time. So I'm gonna let you just have the 
open right. to do what you do when it comes to talking about different treatments. I know that there's so much you could say about it because there's so much to say about everything, but I'm going to let you have the floor here and kind of go over certain things. I know some people have a question about what's the differences between chemo and immunotherapy and endocrine therapy. I, those are the three that I hear about the most. Well, those are the ones that I hear about where people get really confused, but I also know that can be broken down even more, but I'm going to let you have the floor and just <laughs> to, right. to serve over and share. So I will, I will try to keep it quick uh, or brief. So <laughs> we think about, because I could talk, I could talk for a really long time. Um, <laughs> we think about why people see the medical oncologist. We know, so you have surgery to remove your cancer and then you radiation to kind of reduce the risk of recurrence to kill any microscopic cells. Mm -hmm. And for systemic therapy, so this is therapy that goes through the whole body, you're going to see a medical oncologist. So we think about breast cancer there's a number of things that we look at, but how we decide what kind of systemic therapy is really based on a couple of factors. It's based on the size of the cancer. It's based mm -hmm. on how many or if lymph nodes are involved, if they're involved, how many. It's based on your estrogen, progesterone, receptor status, and your HER2 status. And these are biomarkers. And if you have if the presence or absence of certain biomarkers, then that guides the treatment. Okay, and I'm not going to go into how we determine each one because it's, it's, it's a very nuanced and individual yeah. conversation, but these are just some of the things that we look at. Um, and then we get a stage and then that also guides us as well. So chemotherapy, we use chemotherapy for cancers that do tend to be either bigger uh, positive lymph nodes. If they're hormone receptor positive, they may have a high oncotype. For HER2 positive, we use chemo. For triple negative, we use chemo. And the easiest way to think about it is if we feel based on all those factors that the cancer has a higher risk of recurrence, we want to kind of add more aggressive treatment to that. And that's where chemotherapy comes in. So chemotherapy is killing rapidly growing cells in our body. Um, and that's why when you give chemo, people may lose their hair because our hair cells are rapidly growing. We may get mouth sores or nausea and vomiting because the cells of the GI tract are rapidly growing. Your blood counts may drop. So that's why you get all those side effects. So any rapidly growing cells in the body, the chemotherapy really doesn't discriminate. It just kind of comes in and, and tries to kill all those cells. Uh, immunotherapy is different. Now, right now, we only use immunotherapy for triple negative breast cancer and many other cancer types outside of breast cancer. And the way immunotherapy works, it actually tells your immune system to attack the cancer. So Without immunotherapy, your body says, hey, cancer, come into my house. Come, come live here. When we think about when we get a virus, your immune system attacks the virus, right? Gears up and fights mm -hmm. the virus. It doesn't do that with chemo, with cancer until you give it chemotherapy, until you give it immunotherapy. When you give it immunotherapy, that triggers your immune system to attack the cancer. So it's very different than chemo. So the immunotherapy is really harvesting your own immune system to fight the cancer because it's not doing that without those medications. Mm, okay. Then we have endocrine therapy. Um, this is also known as hormone therapy or anti-hormone therapy. So these are for patients who have hormone receptor positive breast cancer, which means that the cancer is in some way driven by the growth of estrogen. Okay. Uh, and what these medications do, there's tamoxifen, there's aromatase inhibitors, but what they do is they block estrogen in different ways. They all have different mechanisms mm -hmm. of action. They block estrogen from going to the cancer cell if there's any residual cells in the body, or they block the production of estrogen altogether so that there's mm -hmm. no estrogen in the body to go. So that's when people get hot flashes, joint pains. Those are side effects of not having estrogen. Right. So and I think where, um, and the lastly, the other targeted therapy is anti-HER2 therapy um, mm. for patients that are HER2 positive. It's a very targeted therapy that targets that HER2 receptor. Um, and I think, you know, one of the challenges with any cancer treatment, and especially in breast cancer and survivorship, is, you know, people go through early menopause. They go through all these horrible side effects of mood changes, hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, impact on libido mood changes and all of that. Um, and it can be really hard. And it's that balance of the, the reason you have the side effects is that they're trying to get rid of the hormones. Right. But so we're helping the cancer, but we're also dealing with side effects. And I think that's really 
uh, very hard, especially for younger women who are going through this. Yeah. So there was a couple of things I want to ask just based mm -hmm. off what you were saying. So I've been hearing a lot of women, this to me is kind of sad, but maybe it's something that's new. They're not knowing what their grade of cancer is, and they're not knowing sometimes what the stage of cancer that they have. Um, now they've gone through treatment or they're in treatment, but they don't have this information. Are some, I know you can't speak to every, you know, to other people's practices, but is there, are, are people, are doctors starting to kind of stay away from really leaning on explaining what the stage is and the grade is to the patients now? I don't think so. To be honest, I think there's just so much information that gets said. Um, and I think grade, you know, so grade tells you there's grade one, grade two, grade three. Now you can find that on your biopsy and on your pathology report. So mm -hmm. if you're listening, first thing you want to do is go pull that report up and it'll be on there. So it tells you how kind of how quickly the cancer is growing. And when grade one is they look at it under the microscope and it looks similar to a breast cancer cell. There's some changes. Um, mm -hmm. to a breast normal breast cell, then grade two, it's growing and grade three, it's growing really rapidly. So it really doesn't resemble when they look at it under the microscope, it doesn't resemble a normal breast cell. Mm -hmm. um, so grade three tends to be more aggressive. You know, these are the cancers that more are more likely maybe to be triple negative, be associated with a higher oncotype. You know, a lot of times people with grade mm -hmm. three do need chemo, but not always, because remember, we're taking all right. those different factors into account. Now, stage, um, you know, I think the challenge here is that your stage is not going to be listed on your pathology report. Right. And this is when I, I always try, I do always try to say your stage of the cancer is this, and this is how we've come up with it. Um, there's mm -hmm. an, there are, it's based on all of those different factors. But if you're not told the stage, and maybe you were, and maybe it was just kind of overlooked, or sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes if you get chemo first, it's a little bit hard to stage it because you're not, you know, you're like, well, it could, it's like this size on the MRI, it's a little different on the mammogram, so it can be a little fuzzy. Um, I would just ask your oncologist, hey, what was my stage? Because we know that honestly, only about 50% of what's said in an appointment truly gets oh, yeah. retained. And so I don't mind people say to me, hey, no, we went over this, but can we go over this again? Or I just want to okay. clarify what my stage was. Because I think when we take a step back, when you're diagnosed, this is a life-changing event. And there's so much happening. You're shuffled test to test, biopsy, the doctor's visits, and you're just trying to survive five honestly yeah. um yeah. and so it's okay to when you're ready and sometimes for some people that six months a year or two years later mm -hmm. when you're ready to process it it's okay to say hey can we have some of those conversations again um but until you ask I don't know that you want to have them so right. always always bring it up um and that's where I think two patient portals can be really helpful um, mm -hmm. because sometimes our visits are limited in time. And I mean, that's just the nature of medicine these days. So I think a great way is to say to your doctor, you know, if I have additional questions, like what would be the best way to contact you? Um, and then you can either, the portal is great because you just put all your questions in right. and, and someone get, you know, you don't need a response, you know, right away, but you can get a response in a few days that, and then you can kind of sit with that and read it and, and process it. Yeah. I always tell people to bring it back to the appointment with them, like their next appointment, have their questions with them, um, especially if they've gotten new reports or something to that extent. When it comes to, um, so let me ask you, because I get this question a lot too, as far as, so DCIS. So when it comes to that, I do know, because that's what I had, but a lot of people ask this question. And I'm like, okay, hopefully she don't touch on to this. But so they have a, a lot of people get a du double mastectomy if it's a lot of cancer in the ducts or preference or what have you. So if they do that and they don't get, say if they're grade three, because a lot of people worry, well, I was grade three and I wasn't given, um, inter I wasn't given any type of hormone therapy. And I'm like, well, I'm not your doctor, but they usually, from my understanding, they don't, um, but ask your doctor. So, um, so I was just curious if you could kind of speak on that a little bit as far as like the DCIS and the treatment of that, especially grade three, because there's been a lot of people asking questions about grade three. 
Absolutely. So that's a great question. So remember, we want, why do we give endocrine therapy? We give endocrine or hormone therapy, those terms are used interchangeably, um, to, they're, they're given to reduce the risk of recurrence. Recurrence mm -hmm. either in the breasts or anywhere else in the body. So for ductal carcinoma in situ, by definition, it is confined to the ducts. So they, right. they are that they have not broken out of the ducts. They can't spread out of the ducts. They can't spread into the lymph nodes. They can't go anywhere else in the body. And so with DCIS, if you have a bilateral mastectomy, then there's mm -hmm. there's it's essentially curable because you've removed everything. Um, right. You know, there are with a mastectomy, there is a chance of re removing, re retaining zero to like 1% of breast tissue, but we don't mm -hmm. find that the benefit of the side effects of hormone therapy, you know, don't outweigh the, out outweigh the benefits rather. For invasive ductal carcinoma, even if you've had a bilateral mastectomy, because it's invasive, it can't go to the lymph nodes, there could be a cell floating around, that's why we give the endocrine therapy. So for DCIS, having a bilateral mastectomy is curable. So there's nothing else right. you need to reduce recurrence risk different than invasive cancer. And so for DCIS grade one or two or three, if you've had a bilateral, you're done. It's yeah. very different if you have like some micro invasion or, you know, focus of invasive cancer, but for just pure DCIS. Yeah. Cause I was, I think the biggest thing was because it the grade of it scared of like a secondary cancer because okay. you know the web you know yeah. is like oh well you're high risk for this that or the third yeah, um which I think and, and that, kinda... makes, that makes perfect that makes perfect sense but we know that there's no benefit you're just going to have create more side effects without mm -hmm. benefit and far as before we get any some new information that I'm sure you have for <laughs> us um you spoke about how these medications, especially like hormone therapy, um, can produce women to kind of like just go into menopause um, because you're blocking things. Well, you know, so you're like your libido, things of that nature. So are there medications that they could talk to their doctor about as far as like if their lifestyle, because, you know, we go through so much with surgery and our bodies and, you know, wanting to be sexual and then it can be some, the mental part of it all. But then when your body feels like it can't react in the way it used to react, are there medications that you all can kind of like give us or give the patient or anything that the patient may need to know far as when it comes to like their sexual, their sex drive and things of that nature? Absolutely. We sometimes um, we actually put people into menopause. We mm -hmm. shut down their ovaries willingly because we know that reduces the risk of recurrence and, and come and then you add that to all these medications and it's a perfect storm for a lot of these you know um, menopausal side effects and there are medications I think the key is really to be open and honest with your doctor and your healthcare team about what you're experiencing because someone I, I mean I see this all the time people say yes I'm having vaginal dryness it's in, you know impacting my libido but it's not that bad but mm -hmm. You know, and I think we we all as women try to downplay some of our side effects. Um, and what I hear a lot, and I hate this, is people say, but I'm lucky to be alive. Well, no, 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 no. Like you're, mm -hmm. yes, I think it's, you want to be grateful that you're here and that you're not, you don't have cancer, but you also, that doesn't mean that you should put down some of these really important issues that we're facing. And I just, I hear this balance, you know, all the time. And I think I always tell people, you can be grateful about that you had an earlier stage cancer or that you don't have cancer right now. Um, you know, maybe you can be grateful that you didn't need chemo or things like that, but you can also be angry and sad and upset about the side effects and what you have to live with. But there are medications. There's medications for hot flashes. There's certain things we can do for joint pain. There's absolutely things we can do for vaginal dryness. Um, vaginal estrogen is something we use a lot and can be very helpful. Um, there are medications for hypoactive sexual desire. So there's things and you know, the thing is too, there's so, so much more research being done on survivorship topics these days which is mm -hmm. really important. Things that we didn't, you know, have data. Um, there was a new non-hormonal medication approved for hot flashes earlier this year, which is mm. 
great for our patients. Um, I think a lot of people struggle with not being able to take hormone replacement therapy if they've gone through menopause right. and they had a hormone receptor positive breast cancer. But there are ways that we can manage those side effects. I think, again, just comes back to that communication. And mm -hmm. I think what you said is really important is, you know, when you come bring your questions to the visit and schedule mm -hmm. another visit if you have to. I will say that sometimes right. it's not enough time to go over everything. So I think mm -hmm. this is where it's okay to say, hey, you know, I know we touched on this today. I'm still struggling with this and this. Can I set up another appointment? And then you have right. the doctor's undivided attention to talk about that. Absolutely. And then also there's so many support groups now that um, can help with this or help you develop the questions. Yeah. The one that I'm connected with, they have actual social workers that, you know, talk to us and can help us. So I think it's important, like you, and social media. I mean, there's groups there if you don't want to go into an actual group, uh, like at a hospital. And you can, but, get, you can get so oh, many, from, you can get a lot of information from all those resources mm -hmm. that you compile and then bring to your doctor and say, you know, I, these are things that I've read about. Can we talk about them? Right. Something that you said, and I have to just commend you for saying it. I've seen it on your IG <laughs> the other day. You said that don't tell people that you have the good cancer. Um, that happened to me. And I was like, it oh did. my God, a doctor <laughs> said it. Thank God. Because I was on the phone. I got my report from the radiologist and she was like, oh, you have, um, you know, well, this was the second set of biopsies. <laughs> and she's like, oh, well, you do have um, ductal carcinoma in site too. All I heard was carcinoma. I heard nothing else. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I was like, you're saying I have cancer? And she's like, yeah, but it's the best one you could have. I was like, what? <laughs> so thank you for being sensitive to that because especially DCS, a lot of people look at it like, well, it's pre-cancer. It's not really cancer. It's, you know, um, and that's a whole nother subject, but I just thank you for saying that because I've heard people who even have stage one um, feel the same way. Like, oh, they said it's like the best cancer I could have because it's more treatable. Um, thank you for that. Well, and I think what happens when we tell people that then people feel guilty about experiencing anything that they experience because of what it's stage one, right? It's, it's the good cancer. Mm -hmm. and all cancer is, again, like I said earlier, is life-changing. Your entire world changes. You know, I like to tell people when we think, when we break down, I say okay, these are good prognostic factors, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's important to talk about within, okay, you've been diagnosed. What are things that guide us in terms of prognosis? We have good prognostic factors and things like that. But I think when we just kind of say, oh, don't worry about it. It's the good cancer. Um, it really it really negates people's experiences and creates right. this conflict for them in terms of how they should feel going mm -hmm. forward. It makes them feel like their experiences aren't important. Right, um, because there's a lot of mental to this. And yeah. that's where our scar speak came from. It was like, we're speaking about the mental and the physical scars of what we've gone through. And with it, you have, some people have PTSD through this, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder and PTSS. So we have so many of those factors and the people, the chemo brain, which now I'm thankful that they are kind of not negating that chemo can't produce memory issues, but I'm thankful they're trying to change the wording of that to more cognitive impairment, because I know I've never gone through chemo, but it was like, as soon as I found out about diagnosis and everything started moving, I start forgetting. I start because everything is overwhelming. So that can play a part in your, your process as far as mentally. So thank you again <laughs> for saying that. Um, before going into some of the new things that's going on um, in the world of breast cancer, what are some things that you can speak to, to men? Because I know that there's a lot of men who, um, I just thought about this because a lot of men have, they're even more starting to become diagnosed with breast cancer. And there anything that you really want them to know, um, far as when it comes to maybe the oncology part of it or whatever you want to share? I think, yeah, it's a great topic. I think male breast cancer is much less common, but it's increasing, number one, like you said. And I do think men, um, based on the research that's out there, tend to feel a little bit more stigmatized 
you know, they, they sometimes people men feel like, oh, this is a woman's disease. And obviously it shouldn't be like that, but that is how they feel. And I think it is challenging from an oncology perspective because male breast, male breast cancer is so rare that all of the treatments tend to be, all of the trials may have five to 10 men and hundreds of women. So all that data is, you know, extrapolated from women. And I think that's, that's hard because how can you say a drug's going to work if it really hasn't been studied in your popular, you know, in, in a specific population? Um, there are, you know, there are focuses now on really making sure we have more male representation that we're really mm. studying male breast cancer. Um, but I think what's important for men to know is men can get breast cancer too. Actually, a lot of people don't know that. And so if you feel a lump, you feel a mass, um, that's not something to ignore, you know, and, and that right. really comes back to what I say about anything is you, we all know our bodies the best. If something doesn't feel mm -hmm. right, it's important to get it checked out. You know, a lot of times people are scared, they're mm -hmm. nervous, they're embarrassed, um, and they don't. Um, but then that's when things grow. And I think, uh, you know, that's the thing that I always kind of push on is, you know, being your own advocate because that no one's going to do it for you as well as you can. Mm -mm. Nope. Um, and I'm glad you touched on the trials and I'm sure you're probably going to touch on it. I'm thinking, but you may or may not, but I want to touch on it from the standpoint, from your standpoint. So we have the male population that we need more men to come into the trials. I also know as an African-American woman, yeah. we're not in trials as much either. Now, with that being said, I think I'm going to speak from my own perspective and that's, this is my own opinion, I think it's a couple of reasons why. Number one, we got the history of the medical profession and our community and the damage that it has caused years ago, which still is that generational trauma that we're still dealing with. Also, just getting education and information to um, women of color or not just Black women, but even Latina women or Latina men. So I was just wondering, from your standpoint as a physician what are you seeing there with the trials because I know most of the trials I look at the numbers often and it's a lot of you know Caucasian people in the trials more so than African-American or the other um, or men so what is your and, and I try so hard to try to share with people like please please do surveys do trials do you know we need all this data to be able to treat because I really believe in my heart and I could be wrong so please correct me we're all differently genetically made up differently and I think that certain races may be even made up differently um there's studies out there trying to say that anyway as far as the genetics but I just want to hear your voice on like the trials and as far as the different um communities Absolutely. I think, I mean, I'm so glad you brought this up. Uh, and as I was talking about men, I wanted to say it. So I'm glad, I'm glad we're talking about it now. <laughs> so we need clinical trials by far. That is how we drive progress. That is how we drive mm -hmm. new drugs. We test hypotheses. But yes, there is a lack of diversity in trials. Um, and, and I will say that there is a huge push in the oncology community to remedy this. Um, and a lot of it, there are all the reasons that you touched on. Yes, there is distrust in the medical profession, distrust in clinical trials. And the challenge is that it's not as simple as saying, you know, for me sitting down with a patient and saying, I'd like you to go on a trial. And they say, you know, maybe they have that distrust or that, that nervousness or hesitation. We have to keep talking about it. Um, but it can be hard. You know, I think it's challenging when a drug is approved and we say, well, these are the most common side effects, but they weren't studied in African-American women or only 4% were African-American. How can you extrapolate, right? How can we counsel our patients on what to expect if, they, if we don't have the data? Uh, I think part of it too is bringing clinical trials outside of the big academic centers and bring mm -hmm. them to the community because I work in a community setting. The majority of patients are treated in the community. Um, and so when we have trials that live in big cancer centers, well, there tends to be less of a diversity in certain cancer centers, but who goes there because it, maybe it's expensive to drive their parkings. You know, there's all these mm -hmm. social determinants of health that 
that really play a role in who gets to go to which centers. Um, you know, getting a second opinion can be really hard if you don't have the financial resources to do it. And I mean, it, this is a, a bigger, bigger topic. Yeah. Um, but I think for all of those reasons, it's so important to increase diversity in trials. And there are a number, you know, the big organizations, ASCO, the American Society for Clinical Oncology, mm -hmm. and others are really pushing this as a top priority. Um, and so I do think that things will change. You know, now trials report on what is the ethnic and racial breakdown. Um, so mm -hmm. you know exactly, um, you know, who was in the study, uh, mm -hmm. what, are, you know, and how, and I'll just give you an example. There were two studies published recently about the differences in how in oncotype testing for mm -hmm. black and white women and how it's not maybe not as reliable in black women compared to white women, right? Well, we how we need that data because if we're then using oncotype for everyone, maybe that's not the right test to use. In another study, um, which I think is really important, they just, it was about a couple of months ago, and they looked at, you know, we always tell people, okay, start breast cancer screening at age 40. Okay, for average risk women, um, younger if you're at higher risk. And they what they did was they actually created these models to see should black women start at the same time as white women. Mm. And they found that they shouldn't. That actually, if we want to save the most lives, black women need to start screening earlier. Right. So yep. I mean, these are tangible differences in outcomes in um, and so I think it's really, I can't say enough about the importance of trials, but I, I want, I'm going to ask you a question as a hmm. provider, as someone, you know, sitting down with a patient, say I have an African-American woman in her family um, mm -hmm. or a Latina woman, you know, and, and the, I can sense that there is some distrust. What is, mm -hmm. how do we bridge that gap? You have to explain everything. And what I mean by that, and I'm going to give you an example. One time I had seroma. And it was, oh, it was a description, but not the word. So I'm looking like, cause I, I'm don't, and it wasn't that she was trying to be insulting. She was just trying to explain what it was. So I tell people all the time, don't just give half information, give the full picture, take time. We don't trust you all the time. I'm just being honest. And it's not necessarily we as a whole, I'm going to speak for myself, but a lot of times in the African-American community, primarily I'm going to speak kind of speak for not everybody but we don't always trust because we've seen what happened to Henrietta Lacks and the Tuskegee project those things are still very prevalent in our heads to this day and then you have the generations before us like be careful with the doctors and stuff like that now I came from a different situation where my mom pushed us like you're gonna go to the doctor but that's not everybody's story and then like you said there's transportation so if those needs aren't met, then why would I even come to your place of service in the first place? I can't get there, number one. But if I get there, don't talk down to me. You know, a lot of times that's a big thing. And I don't think sometimes certain physicians understand how they're talking down to people. Um, another example, I have a, I had a client one time and I took her to the doctor and I was advocating for her and I was kind of taken back because this was an African-American physician. And I looked at her file and I was like, oh, you have, um, COPD. And he was like, yeah, she has it. And I was like, so you have constructive, uh, um, you know, pulmonary disease. And she was like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And he's like, how do you know that? Cause I know about, it. don't ask me how I know, but why don't she know? Yeah. She wouldn't understand it. And I was like, well, explain it to her. I said, do you know what emphysema is? <laughs> so, you know, I helped him to explain it to her. But for years, she had this and didn't know. And unfortunately, two years later or three years later, she died of cancer. So it has to be not only having the patient, but like you said, try to have someone to come in to advocate with them. But do not talk down to people and take your time and explain. I think a lot of times we feel rushed and I, that's probably just not African-American, but you just feel rushed because y'all only have it so much time to, to talk to someone. Um, that's a big issue though. But also know that what we're complaining about is real. The biggest thing also is pain. We talk about pain. A lot of African-American people will say that they're hurting. Well, I think with some physicians from a long time ago, pain was like black people can tolerate pain. No, we hurt. 
<laughs> we hurt. And when we're telling you we're hurting, check it out and be in denied service. I, this all happened to me in 2015. I was given a mammogram and an ultrasound and the radiologist denied me of my ultrasound. For what reason? I had symptoms, inverted nipples, hot to touch, pulsating vein, I had all these symptoms and you denied me of an order that my doctor gave me. So then I come back and then if I don't have the support of the doctor, then I'm just out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so those are some things that really, really rub me the wrong way. And it's, it, you don't want to always say it was a rest, a race thing, but then it's like, well, what really is it then? Um, and then you do have ageism too, where patients aren't being shared information because their doctor says, this is the best thing for you because, and that's it. They don't say because you may have diabetes or it's like a preference that they choose for them. And sometimes that happens to us as well, but just not talking down to someone. Um, if they don't understand it, just be patient and talk to the person and let them know and explain, this is the word, this is seroma, and this is what it means. This is what it can do without just assuming they wouldn't understand because that builds trust because now you're putting the ball back in my court once you give me the information. But if you're not giving me all the information, but you're assuming that I can't even understand. You're not even giving me a clear playing field to try to be able to get treated correctly. And don't deny me of services that I am supposed to receive. And don't deny me of not hearing me when I say I hurt and I have these issues. So there, I mean, there's so much, but those are some of the ones that I can think of right off the top of my head. Oh, that's really like almost 20 years, almost 20 years before I got the actual diagnosis. Oh, I think I, I think it's so important. And I think this is why these conversations are so important. Um, and the one other thing I'll add is, you know, very often, and I, I try to make sure I bring up clinical trials for everyone, even if we don't have them, just to say, I don't have an open clinical trial that you qualify for because so many patients have not even heard the word clinical trial or said, oh, my doctor didn't bring it up. And often they didn't bring it up because there was no trial. But I think if people are listening, I think it's important to ask, is there a clinical trial? Just so to get that conversation going, because I do think, and I, you know, sometimes they're just not brought up for, you know, yeah. thinking, oh, this person's not going to understand or whatever, whatever it is. And right. I think, you know, putting those words out there is so important and asking those questions. And, it, and sometimes, you know, I had a doctor, I was getting a hysterectomy and he didn't want to bring up, present hysterectomy to me. And I was like, why? And he said, because a lot of African-American women don't want a hysterectomy. I said, but you're assuming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Give me the option. I know what I've been through and let me make that choice. Don't assume based off generalization and stereotypical things. Um, so educate me, let me know what I'm dealing with. Like you said about a clinical trial, some people, they hear the word trial and it's like, nope, because I already seen what, <laughs> what, what happened to people before. But it, I think if they know, but what I've done now is that when I know someone, um, is trying to go through with even chemo, anything, I usually send them to an organization called touch touches. I don't know if you've heard of them, yeah. but you know, about the clinical trial, because at the same time, that's someone that looks like that person that can share with them their experience with going through a clinical trial that helped them live. Yeah. I, and they, that's important too. There's some really incredible resources out there. And I think that connection mm -hmm. and great right, finding someone who's gone through it, who looks like you, I mean, really can't be understated or, you know, stated mm -hmm. enough. They think there's so, so much power in that community. Yeah, it's power in um, definitely having representation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and making people feel like they're heard. And so I, I think that to me, those are a lot of the issues that we're having with the, the breakdown of everything to me. Yeah, and we just have to continue to do the work and have these conversations. And mm -hmm. and I think I think we will see positive change or I'm hopeful that oh, we yeah positive change and I think it is improving but progress unfortunately is slow now one thing that I mean I'm sure your hospital may be doing this but it's something that I'm thinking well I'm actually in the process of doing with a friend of mine tapping into the community not just like you stated far as people can't always get to the hospital 
have someone to go to them, go into their environment. Like I told you, I went to a radio station because I knew what population they spoke to. So they weren't gonna come to me. So I went to them. And I think that's so huge. If we can get people in the medical field to actually go into the community. I'm not saying just during an event or during October. I'm talking about ever so often. Okay, we're going to go to this particular, you know, low income, envi you know, environment. And we're going to talk to the, off the housing office because a lot of them usually have classrooms where you can teach. And we're going to teach classes. That's an option, but to wait for someone to come to us is not going to always happen. So we have to go there. Yes, you have to go in those high risk areas and not just during an event. And I think I'll add to that, not just during work hours. Absolutely. At, at night or on a weekend. And I think very often, you know, the, the healthcare system, I will say, is really not set up for people who work because no. especially people who, you know, I've had patients tell me, I can't come today because I'm going to lose four hours of my salary or I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. And if I lose my job, you know, and so I think that I can't we live. have to be, you know, we have to have these events when people can come and we have to have um, not just events, we have to have access to healthcare during mm -hmm. evening hours and weekend hours. And I think it's challenging and it requires a lot of creativity, but we got to get, you know, it's impossible to say to people, well, we're open from nine to five. Sorry, you work from eight to six, <laughs> you know, like, Too bad. like <laughs> and then, and then I think, you know, too, I mean, we, and then what, people get labeled and I hate to say this, sometimes people get labeled as non-compliant yeah. they're not coming to their appointments, but they literally can't get there. And, and I yeah. think this is not necessarily just a racial, you know, barrier, right. think, but when we talk about, again, that social determinants of health and socioeconomic status you know, I had a woman recently and she's, she'd missed a couple of appointments and she just said, I, I can't use my phone during the day and I can't make it to my appointments because I'm going to lose my job. Yeah. And, and she's like, I want to come to my appointments, but I don't know what else to do. So I, I think that that again is asking those questions, you know, what's going on at home. And I think this comes back to what you said about knowing the person more than who it's not the person is not their cancer. You are not your cancer. Right. You are so much more than that. And if we know, we know what people are struggling with or even ask, I think yeah. you just really can have a better understanding in a relationship. Absolutely. And that's why I'm really focusing on certain areas um, where I live to go into those areas. I did it as a case manager for mental health. So I can do it as what I'm doing right now and go during the evening or early morning or whenever. Um, and, and also something my friend and I are working on are going into military um, bases because I'm a, I, my husband was active duty. He's retired now. She's currently, her husband's currently active duty. People think, oh, they got medical, they got all that. Yeah, but they're not always, they always don't know. So that's another population of people, but they're not necessarily, they go to the doctor, but they're not necessarily going to have a conversation. Usually when they're having a conversation, it's about selling Tupperware, or, you know, pampered yeah. stuff and chilling and, you know, trying to pray our husbands come back from deployment and some of them are working. So going into that establishment because we have the ability to do so because we still have access to that. We're doing that as well. So um, I know that you wanted me to touch on some of the new things. Yeah, 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 please. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I think we're going to have to do a part two. We are. We are definitely, definitely. Um, if you're willing to come on, I could talk to you I'm, forever. I'm but definitely willing, willing to come, to come on. Come on. Um, but I do have a few minutes. So let's maybe quickly, I think, um, you know, again, there's so much new happening in breast cancer. And I, I think the key, the thing I will say is that there's so many new drugs that we didn't have Um even just two to three years ago. The big game changer in breast cancer has been trastuzumab deroxycan, which um, the, mm -hmm. that is the generic name. The brand name is in HER2. And it was initially approved for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. So when we think metastatic cancer that has spread outside of the breast and the axilla, or the armpit and elsewhere in the body. And there was a study that was presented at our big oncology meeting in June of 2022 called the Destiny Breast 04 trial. And they looked at 
we used to always think of you were either HER2 positive or HER2 negative. And they created this new category of HER2 low. Um, so you weren't quite positive, but you weren't, you were, you know, you had some HER2 expression. And they found that in HER2 worked dramatically in that population. So it gave a new treatment option to 50% more patients with metastatic breast cancer, which was just really incredible. Wow. Um, and we've had some other drugs that have followed, but this has really been a game changer for a lot of our patients. And, and there's so much more research ongoing. Um, that's a class of medications called antibody drug conjugates. And we're seeing more new drugs mm -hmm. in that space. Um, and I think we're also honing in on who we need to treat with more, who we need to escalate and where we can de-escalate. You know, I think it's really this era of personalized medicine of figuring out, you know, we're still working on who is going to recur, who is not going to recur. And, and that's, I think it's getting there and it's coming slowly. Um, but I, I also, I think that breast cancer in five to 10 years is going to look very different than breast cancer now in a good way. I think we're going to have new mm -hmm. drugs, we're going to have new treatment options. People are going to live longer. Um, we are seeing younger breast cancer, and we were talking about that. Um, we're seeing younger cancer in general. There was a new study just published that said from 1990 through 2019, there has been a 79% increase in people getting diagnosed with cancer under 50. There's a new study talking about pollution and our air quality increases mm -hmm. breast cancer risk, things in the environment. So I think we're also moving toward trying to get a better sense of more risk factors and how we can maybe modify that risk. Um, but yes, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot coming. It's good. There's a lot of change, yeah. which, which is, which is great. Yeah. Maybe next time we'll have you to come on and talk about the risk factors, yeah. um, whole, but we'll definitely get to that. Um, so what was, what was the reason for your song? Um, Unstoppable. Mm -hmm. Sia, I think that's yeah. her name. So love, love that song. Um, so backstory to that song. Um, I think that song came out, I want to say like, 20, I don't remember when it came out, but during COVID, and I know I'm pretty, like it was out, I remember I was sitting in the hospital parking lot. And I had to go in and round and that song was playing. And I was like, okay, I don't want to, you know, the hospital at that point was, I mean, it was full of yeah. COVID. Then I just remember being like, I don't want to go in there. And, you know, it just kind of motivated me um, to, to do it. But I will say it always makes me think of all of my patients and how they are unstoppable during treatment and beyond and how, you know, people always say to me, I don't know how I can do this. I say, you have to, you don't have a choice, you know, you have to do this. Um, and so I think to me just really embodies kind of the spirit of oncology that we just, we keep going in the face of all of the hardships and the struggles and, and death. Um, there is still light and there's still joy. Um, and you can have, and I, you can have light and joy and love and in, in the face of really awful sorrow and grief. Um, so that song for me embodies all of that. Absolutely. And what's one word that you can leave with the audience to help them who are going through their scars and their wounds and they're having a difficult time? What's a word that you can leave with them and why? I think, I think endurance or endure. Um, you know, I think that there is, there's so many there's so much hardship, like I said, um, but yet, you know, we, you know, all the survivors, all the thrivers, all the previvors out there just continue to endure um, because again, we move forward, right? And I think the other part is, and I, this is, I love Peloton and this is a big saying on Peloton, but um, so I'm just going to copy it, but forward is a pace. And I think sometimes when that progress feels really slow, you're just putting one foot forward and that is still a pace and you're still moving forward. Awesome. And where can people find you if they want to find you or if you want them to find you? <laughs> Absolutely. I hope you do. Um, so I'm Dr. Toplinski on all social media platforms. It's the same. Um, and I also do host a podcast called Interlude, where I really talk to, I share people's stories, uh, whether they're professionals, whether they're patients, whether they're caregivers, um, but anyone who's been impacted by cancer in any way. And it really, I will say, talking to people um, has made me a better doctor, truly. Uh, and it's just something I love to do. And so I hope, I hope you check it out. Awesome. Well, I just want to leave you with this one thing that you are a very fierce and compassionate person. I hope you stay that way. I hope you continue to listen to your patients 
and just know that your scars in life, they do matter as well. And they do speak a story. And I'm thankful that you came up here and shared. And I know it has to be difficult at times, especially being a female in the profession that you're in, because primarily it's a lot of males, Um, but you're still persevering and we need you and your voice matters and continue to speak. We love you so much. Um, Well, that concludes another episode of Our Scars Speak. We thank each and every one of you for listening. Remember that our mental and our physical scars speak a story, one that must be told and should be told. When you're going to tell it, I don't know, but I encourage you to do so because lives can be saved and wounds can be healed. Till next time, we see you later. Bye. Thank you.